I've been in farming my whole life. I'm a sixth generation farmer and I grew up on a farm. But farming can be really tough. So as I got older, I really wanted to run away from that. I didn't want to be a farmer. So as soon as I was old enough to go to university, I ran down to Sydney seeking a better life. And it took me about 10 years to realise this was the better life. What the world knows as tea tree oil is the essential oil that's produced by the steam distillation of the native Australian species called Melaleuca alternifolia. When we produce it from a commercial point of view, it's growing like a bush. Tea tree in the wild isn't like that. Tea tree in the wild is actually a full tree. So it's about seven meters or about almost 40 feet tall as a natural tree and often it'll get a papery bark. Here in Australia, people often call that a paper bark tree. Australia's got a unique flora, and it's largely of Gondwan in origin. So once upon a time, there was two major continents. We had Pangaea. Pangaea broke into Laurasia, which is North America and Europe and Asia connected, and Gondwana land, which was the supercontinent that combined Antarctica, Australia, Africa, South America. Australia has been largely separated geographically for the majority of its history since being separated from Gondwana land. That's really the defining feature of Australian flora. What that's resulted in is biogeographical separation of the plants that were once contiguously connected and that's created much more biodiversity because of that bioregionalisation. Australia is really isolated. It would take two to three months to get here from Europe. It's over 21,000 kilometres away. The first known European landing was by a Dutch navigator in 1606. In 1770, Captain James Cook claimed Australia for England. He was mapping part of Australia he called New South Wales. When the first colony was established at Port Jackson, which is now called Sydney, the original colonists tried to find something that they could use to export. It's unlikely that they took much knowledge from local Indigenous people because local Indigenous people have codes of respect and secrecy where they don't share that type of knowledge. The knowledge is often held by particular members of the community and to this day there's quite a lot of undiscovered or unexplored medicines in Australian plants because that information is held in secrecy. They don't tell outsiders this knowledge. So the settlers had to really observe how the Aborigines were using the plants and adopt those for the ailments that they were having. There's a vast medicinal materia medica in the Australian Indigenous people's folklore. While they didn't distill oils, they definitely used and still do use Australian medicinal plants for the type of ailments that people living in those sort of conditions suffer. So lacerations, skin infections, burns, those type of things that people living in the bush wind up with. Interesting historical fact about tea tree oil is how tea tree oil came to have its name. Captain James Cook, when he landed in Australia and was moving up the coast, he stopped off to what was the traditional region of the Bundjalung people. And they had a concoction of tea that they would produce from the leaves of a tree with this white papery bark that we now know as Melaleuca. They were able to produce a tea from that and that was used for sore throats or for other ailments. Eventually, as the settlers started seeing those remedies and those plants working, they put a lot more energy and time and focus into researching how those plants were working. What they were interested in back then more than anything was how do you produce tea tree oil? Back before 86, 87, almost all of the tea tree oil that was being produced was from wild trees. So you go into the wilds of the Bungawalban and you find a tree and you cut the branches off it and you steam distill it, you collect the oil and you hope it's the right oil. Very often it wasn't the oil that you were looking for. In the late 1800s, the Sydney Museum supported programs for research into botanical resources from Australian native plants. There's a few heroes of Australian essential oils that were involved in that research early on, but in particular Arthur Penfold. The modern discovery of tea tree was in the late 1800s. It was identified as having some interesting properties. 
But it wasn't until the early 1920s that Sir Arthur Penfold did his seminal research on various Australian plants, including tea tree, Melaleuca alternifolia. Penfold and his colleagues worked extensively documenting Australian native oils and amongst those identified oils like tea tree oil as having quite a high capacity for commercialisation. He discovered that tea tree really works. It's a really good natural therapeutic oil. Tea tree and other natural remedies were used up through World War II. In fact, there was reports of tea tree being used in Australian soldiers' kits to help deal with any cuts or infections or that that they suffered on the battlefield. After the Second World War, with the advent of antibiotics, natural antimicrobial products like tea tree oil fell out of favour, and that industry declined significantly over the next few decades. And it wasn't until the 80s that that started getting picked up again. And it was around that time that the Australian government started getting interested in helping to create more of a global market for tea tree oil and to establish the safety and the efficacy of tea tree oil for markets around the world. The Australian economy has always been based around agriculture. We have got some great farming lands, some great industries, and they, they think supporting those industries is great for the communities. One of the downsides of the market growing so well and so quickly is that people recognise that there is an opportunity in that market. And unfortunately there are some unscrupulous people who come into the market and they adulterate the essential oils. So they take a perfectly good essential oil and then they will add adulterants to it to thin it out and to make a larger volume and therefore they can sell more or they can create an oil synthetically. What's happening is, of course, people are thinking, oh, chuck a bit of eucalyptus in there. Nobody's going to know the difference. So this adulteration's been going on forever, at the farm level as well back then. A lot of people jumped on a bandwagon to put tea tree in the ground, and there wasn't a lot of communication about organising how much was being produced, pricing, and so people started undercutting each other to the point that gate prices became much lower than actual production costs and a lot of people then just gave up on the product. Those plantations were not economically viable and it caused the market to collapse. Too much supply, not enough demand at that point in time. My wife's family's been involved in farming for six generations now in Australia. I'm from the United States, but I married into an Aussie farming family, and it's gotten in my blood. We've had a massive amount of support and assistance in the market because of us having been in the industry for so long. When we wanted to establish a farm, we went to the Australian Tea Tree Industry Association, ADIA. I don't know of any other essential oil besides tea tree oil that has an organisation supporting it like the Australian Tea Tree Industry Association. The main purpose of the Tea Tree Association is to help coordinate a number of growers. We've got about 140 growers that produce tea tree oil. On their own, they're vulnerable. If they act as a group and they act together, we can do better things. The farming community in Australia try and produce the best product they possibly can. They put a lot of time and a lot of effort into it and they're really genuinely proud of what they're doing. And there's a cost involved in that. If somebody is selling material, adulterated material, or even real material at below the cost of production, the farmer's not gonna make a living. When companies adulterate tea tree oil, that threatens not only the tea tree oil that that grower has produced, but it threatens the industry as a whole. It's people cheating and it's been done for decades. We know it's been done for decades and it's not just for tea tree oil, but our industry's been pushing back for the last 10 years, really pushing back. Our farm is very close to the town of Lismore. There they've established a university um, called Southern Cross University, which has a world-renowned analytical laboratory for essential oils testing. One of the things that Adia does is to go out to retail shelves around the world, purchase tea tree oil samples that are available at the retail level, and have them tested back at Southern Cross University Labs. We've been doing that now for well over a thousand samples worldwide over about seven years, and the results of that are really quite astounding. We purchase bottles of tea tree oil off the shelf at random, and 
I think it's 15, 16 countries that I've done this in now. The worst I ever get is 100%. Every single bottle is not tea true. My name's Ashley Dow. I'm the manager of the Analytical Research Laboratory at Southern Cross Plant Science, Southern Cross University. Ashley works on the technical committee of the International Standards Organization, has helped to evaluate the new standards and also evolving standards of essential oils such as tea tree oil. Standardisation of essential oils is extremely important for allowing open trade of these products. It's very easy for a buyer in another country to believe that what they have is representative of the entire range of chemotypes that occur. And that can be a problem because while a chemotype might be great, it might not be great to produce. And it may not necessarily be the best product that's out there. There's often quite a range. So looking at purity and purity establishment is also important for consumers from just knowing and being able to rely upon the consistency of that product that you buy. It's a dark art, I must say. We've seen all sorts of combinations being put together. One thing that we do see is that whoever's doing it is getting much better at it and it's becoming harder and harder to find indicative sort of synthetic molecule residues there that let us know it's been synthesised. It's quite difficult in standardisation to capture that breath. We can often visually see that an oil is adulterated, but you're looking at over 100 molecules. If we've got something that's really weird, and we have had a couple of really weird ones, we'll take it to the next level and we'll ask for a deep dive into what's actually in there. Australia has a fantastic support system for its agricultural industries. So we've been able to work with AgriFutures Australia to allocate research dollars to identifying new means of proving the purity of tea tree. The uh, important thing that the R&D funds funds is the safety and efficacy of tea tree oil, making sure that it's safe to use. There's a popularisation of essential oils and at times promoters of essential oils will stretch the, the evidence that's there to, to create some nice marketing angle. Tea tree oil's certainly not one of those products. It's used primarily as an antimicrobial. It's a really good topical antiseptic and it has a very pleasant aroma that alternative people are more inclined to want to use natural products sort of goes hand in hand then with the naysayers who want to you know, discount the claims that are around that, but there's clear clinical evidence for the activity of tea tree oil as an antimicrobial substance. Australian tea tree oil really has a strong brand around the world. That brand is based upon the safety and the efficacy that consumers have come to know and appreciate. Any adulteration of tea tree oil or any claims that tea tree doesn't work that are false, we need to address because that affects the brand. My parents started their tea tree farm in 1997. I was very proud of them to do that because it was a very gutsy move for them. And they, although they'd always been in farming, they had not been in tea tree farming before. So it was a big deal when they decided to start their farm. My name is Robert Seckham. And I'm Elaine Seckham. When I met Rob, their family was all farming. His uncles, everybody, all the men throughout his family had all farmed. Dad's always been a farmer, as has his family. So it's been a state of just being. Well, it's sort of defined as a bit of recreation, really, sort of. I know people, some people play sports, some people do things, and sort of farming is sort of part of that, and it just keeps your mind occupied and, and just something to do, really. You can be creative about something. Seckham's a very proud family very proud of who they are and they always were very, very hardworking people. Worked the land, loved the land. My grandmother was really interested in our heritage and so she has written a couple of books about the farming heritage going back into England. Uh, we come from the Devon area. We have a certificate presented to Mr. W.R. Seckham from the Heritage Farm Devon County Show, who successfully established his claim that his family has continuously farmed the same land in Devon for the longest period dating from 1320 to 1975. To quote the Farmers Weekly, the Seckhams rarely think about the long, long line of Seckhams who have gone before them. They have lived quietly farming their land and minding their business. 
It just gives you satisfaction what you do, and I'm sorry, I just can't explain it. It's just achievement. Well, it might be much, but it's a fair bit. It's in your blood. It's just what you do. I know what you're saying. It's hard to explain. It's just what you do. Deanne's parents got involved in the industry as long-time multi-generational farming family, and they planted their farm out in Tea Tree in about 1996. We had been into dairy cattle and the dairy industry collapsed. So we had to do external jobs and we had jobs in town and did that for a number of years while the kids were at school. That was at the time then Robert decided that tea tree would be a good thing to do. That way we were able to move back to farming. Everything was so new back then and there was relatively little known from a farm perspective. So they took a big risk in doing what they did. Deanne's parents have been in the industry since the mid-90s and he's not a large farmer in terms of hectares. In fact, we'd call him a small medium grower, but he does the right thing. And when the prices crashed, very shortly after he joined, he was having trouble moving his stock and he was making a loss at it. We have discussed at times whether we would move, but there's no way Robert could not live here. He'll not be here on the farm, he's told me that. You know, and um, it's what he'll always do. It was a really ugly period where there'd been massive oversupply and prices were rock bottom. It wasn't worth growing tea tree oil. In fact, many of the plantations were ripped out or simply abandoned. When that market crashed because of this oversupply issue. At about the same time, Deanne and I were starting to have children. Her career in consulting and traveling three to five days a week just wasn't going to be compatible with children. So she decided to step back out of that world and help her parents for a little bit of time to sell the tea tree oil off their farm. There was no way she was going to see us go under, so she put everything into making sure that she was able to sell our oil. I really didn't know where to start. And if you think 18 years ago, I mean, sure, we had the internet, but it just wasn't the, the powerhouse of information. So then I would literally go out into shops and find out who was putting tea tree into their products and then started doing my research, getting names, ringing the switchboard, finding out who was in purchasing, a lot of cold calling for those first couple of years, just trying to find the right person. That got her interested in working with some of these leaders in the natural health products around the world. And she loved that industry. She loved working with these people who were really passionate about doing something good for the world and something good for their customers. That perhaps was a little different from some of her previous life. You really had to find that right market. Who were those people who wanted the long-term relationship, who valued quality of oil, and that traceability was important to them, back to the roots, back to the farm, was key to who they were. So I did find those people, it took a long time, probably had about five years of cold calling while I worked out who was who in the industry, developed the relationships, and I still have all of those customers today and that's 18 years later. It's big, it's big what you did, what you went through for us. You're going to get upset and I'm going to get upset. She has done so much, we wouldn't be where we are today without having Deanne done what she's done. And that just goes to show the love of family, really, because Deanne wouldn't have done that, I don't believe. It hadn't been purely to help us. Farmers growing tea tree to produce the best quality tea tree from which we get the oil. Spend their lives day in, day out, early mornings, late nights, worrying about the frost that's going to come when the temperatures get low, or floods, or the drought and they've relied upon that brand reputation of tea tree oil around the world to help to move their product. They have children. They have school fees. They have a life to lead. They need to make a margin. They need to make a reasonable margin so that they can live. They're good people. They foster the land. They look after 
what's going on in this world for the next generation, for all generations thereafter. You get these unscrupulous people coming in and undercutting their livelihood, their income. It's unacceptable to me. It's what makes me probably the most angry. We love the farm, we love having it, we love every single part of that process has just been such a great journey. You know, if all this went away tomorrow, I think what I would miss is actually getting out and getting the dirt in my fingers and working with the guys out in the paddock to see what's going on with the trees and being out in nature. I'd miss helping people. I'd miss looking out to the trees and knowing that the, those little trees are growing and they're producing oil and they're going to be going off to be bottled up or put into some product and going out to help people in a natural way. From the coconut industry alone, about 25 to 30% of Filipinos directly and indirectly benefit from it. It's pretty substantial. That's why we, we want to help do our own small bit in taking care of our farmers because a lot of people benefit from it.